Welcome to Trail Talk here on LTTV. I'm Chris Ford. I'm the Director of Marketing of Illinois Eastern Community Colleges and Lincoln Trail College. And joining me, as always, is Dr. Zahi Atala, the President of Lincoln Trail College. Zahi, how are you today? Great. Yourself? I'm good. Well, Zahi, we Happy been... Labor Day. Yes. Belated. Belated. Yes. Ah, jinx. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've been talking a lot about student success over the last several months, and we're going to kind of continue uh, mm -hmm. in that realm today, but what we're going to do today is talk about this uh, at, at a, a much smaller level than we've been talking about recently, which has been at the institution level, but we're going to talk today specifically about student success within the classroom and recognizing basically ways students learn and, and working mm -hmm. with them uh, to make sure that basically they're getting the most out of the class that they can. Right, um, so uh, in effect, the business of the college doesn't happen in our hallways in, and through the website as much as it happens in the classroom. And the conversation today is how can we optimize the experience and the learning for our learners when they uh, come here, whether it's the literal in our classroom or virtual through our uh, online and, and hybrid and, and uh, high flex classes. Well, I think so many people, when they, they think about a college class, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, and I mean, this was the first thing that came to mind for me for a long time, was you know, the professor in the tweed jacket with the leather elbow patches yeah. that, you know, is going to... <laughs> Mr. Oxford <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or Cambridge. <laughs> that, that's going to, you know, stand in the front of the class and lecture the entire time. Yeah. And, you know, to some extent, that's a stereotype, but it's also a stereotype that was based on a little bit of reality. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and what, uh, you know, as you're speaking, in my mind, it wasn't conjuring the tweed jacket. It was conjuring the, the so many uh, boards, chalkboards, that they would bring down and up. And, you know, you didn't have time to copy because it was up there and, and um, so yes, we've all gone through those things, but the reality is it doesn't matter what the technology and the format, whether it's 300 or three students, is how can we focus the education on the needs of the individual? How can we tailor it to what, you know, you and I when we were going uh, uh, to, uh, to college or, or every person? And, irrelevant, the time is irrelevant, technologies are gonna always improve. Right, and you know, the, the reality too is everybody learns in a little different way. Yes. Um, you know, you may have people that will thrive in that lecture and I'm gonna write down notes and I'm gonna go back and read the textbook and I'll thrive in that environment. You'll have other people that are, are hands-on learners and our career and technical courses are great for that because yes. you can't lecture about welding, for example, and never get in a welding booth and actually do it. Well, you could. You I, don't could. Know, I, I don't know about the quality of welding that right, comes out of that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in reality, you, you have this mixture of yeah. learners, and it's, it's finding ways to engage all of those different kinds of learners and, and finding ways to bring out the most in them. Absolutely, and, and to me it, it takes, it's, it's been a debate for, for a really long time. About 100 years ago, uh, John Dewey, a little over actually, published his book about uh, democracy and education and um, you know, he talked about his idea of meeting the student needs, that all students don't learn the same way that we need to do experiential learning, what you described in terms of the kinesthetic elements and, and learning by doing and what have you. And how, how interesting that we went, rather we celebrate the way we talk about how, we, how much he's transformed education and then we went the uh, road of a guy who thought differently, which is Thornburg. And he thought that, you know, well, 
as a good psychologist, is there a test that is universal that we can use to understand how people understand things and learn? And we went the route of placement tests and, and those uh, uh, ready-made place uh, a high stakes test and that's what we do because we want to even the plane with the mindset of equity we are going the route of allowing only a few people the people who can sorry to be gross here but people who memorize and regurgitate mm -hmm. the information as opposed to making sure that every person in the classroom is getting the, lear the learning outcomes well, of course, one of the things that, that we've also learned, and, and you're seeing many colleges drop things like the ACT and SAT right. as a requirement yeah. Yeah. For, for entrance, because one of the things that, that is becoming clearer and clearer to people is those standardized tests don't always truly reflect the intelligence of somebody and, right. and how good of a student they can be, it reflects them in the moment of taking that test, and there are some people that just aren't good test takers. Oh yeah, there are lots of people who are not good test takers. Moreover, it's a sliver of the knowledge, and it favors, and data has borne, uh, have borne that it favors particular individuals. Certain zip codes are associated with improved ACT scores versus less affluent ones where it's not. Uh, so yes, we in the colleges, we at LTC, have been trying and will be even more diligent at thinking about our placement, but also how can we support the growth and development of our faculty in the classroom? Because remember, we hire people based on minimum qualifications in a subject matter but you didn't go to school and, uh, to teach broadcast journalism, you went to school to be a broad, broadcast journalist. And yes, you have subject matter expertise, and one, the other one is an art and a science, similarly in my field and so on. So what do we do? We just make them sign the contract and we put the foot in their back and shove them into the classroom and hope that they're gonna do a fantastic job, which is not fair to them or the student. You're talking about my student publications class right now, aren't For you? example. <laughs> For yeah, example. So, you know, and, and honestly, I mean, that, that is a good example where, um, you know, we, we had an opportunity this year where we were going to go down this road and we needed somebody to, to teach this class. And I was asked to do that because of my experience in journalism uh, and it's experience that I have here that nobody else has. Uh, now, fortunately, I grew up in education, right. uh, so I have some ideas, but I won't lie, for me, it's moderately terrifying to walk into a classroom and I don't have that innate knowledge necessarily of how to take what I know and impart that on somebody else. Right. And it's not the part where you talk to the students and explain that may be problematic for many. So we tell them, oh, you need to put your grades in Canvas or take attendance. What does that mean? Well, it's our LMS. What does that mean? Right? How do, you f how do those things function? Oh, we, HLC wants us to do a learning outcome assessment, so you figure it out. What is learning outcome, right? What is, uh, what is an assessment? How do you do those? Is it different from my grade? Uh, how do you grade, right? All of those things are, you, you could have grown in, in a family of educators, but those things that your mother and your father have gone to school to learn how to do, whereas mm -hmm. you and I, because of our subject matter expertise, have an opportunity to teach but we haven't learned them. Right, well, and, you know, going a little bit deeper, too, and sort of how we started was, you know, how do you work with the students in your class to get the most out of them? How do you find that balance between... Most out of them? Are we squeezing them? Or is it the most <laughs> to them as individuals? And I'm, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be pedantic, but... Right. 
Uh, I mean, you know, so the student can can grow yep. the most. Sure. Um, Develop as a learner. Yes, uh, that, that's a much more eloquent way of putting that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, but but how do you find that balance? Because there, there, you know, basically needs to be some component of lecture. Yes. There generally is going to be some component of, of hands-on learning. There should be. There's going to be some component of how you're incorporating technology into your class. And the list goes on and on and on. Um, yes. You know, but uh, you, you, you forgot what, what could be an even more helpful tool, which is how to contextualize the information. Right. So, you know, chemistry, like in this lab, what is the purpose of it? You know, we, math, what's the purpose? We need to put it in a context that the students can understand. And you and I have talked about, you know, what does, it, what does a quadratic equation mean? Well, it means every time you hit a golf ball, every time you toss a football and what have you. Those are, those are in their simplest form, quadratic equations. Why do we push students time and again to just resolve a formula as opposed to understand why they're doing that? In addition to all of what you said, those are crucial things that we need to focus on. Yeah, and I think the, the why is, is really important. Um, yeah? You know, Excellent. There, there's the joke that, you know, little kids, why? They ask why oh, all my the gosh, time. Yeah. Uh, or big ones, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, yes. I mean, really, why? Why? You know, how does this fit into the big picture? What does this mean? Um, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Yes. Uh, you know, I think about technology, and I tend to be somebody that does a better job retaining knowledge when I can be a hands-on learner. Okay. Um, I was, you know, I, I, I was very good at taking something from a book and understanding that, but when I could take that and apply it in a hands-on way, it, it registered more with me. So, you know, for me, somebody that is going to bring me into a lab like this, for example, and give me some stuff, that's going to help me see it more. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've learned a ton on YouTube now, which was something that wasn't available to me when I was in college. I mean, the infancy of the internet as we know it now was beginning when I was in college. And, um, you know, we, we had just moved beyond our slate tablets at that point. Uh, <laughs> and not electronic <laughs> slate tablets. Uh, but, you know, things like that weren't available. And I think back now, if I were to go back in time and, mm -hmm. and retake some of those classes mm -hmm. with what's available now, what is that gonna look like? Right, right, right. And, 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 and I'm, as you were talking, I was thinking, we need to be as current as our students are. We can't say, well, this is how I learned it in the format I learned it. Because our teachers went to school probably in the 60s and 70s. Um, was, it, was there a whole lot of difference between them and their teachers who went to school in the 50s and 40s in terms of technology? There wasn't necessarily. So why would we be stuck in a 100-year-old way of doing things as opposed to adopting the newer approaches and adapting to the world where our students live. Well, and I think the, the other part of that, too, is it's important not to make the assumption that all of our students know and understand technology. Amen, brother. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy to think that, yeah, most kids in this generation probably grew up with a cell phone, grew up with a smartphone, had computer access since they were little. But that's not the case with all of them. And a phone doesn't necessarily translate into all of the tools for learning, right? right. It, it gives you access to some, but not everything. 
Right. Well, I mean, just like we can't tell an instructor, go on Canvas and do this, we can't expect a student right. to know exactly how to submit an assignment on Canvas, for example. Yes. Uh, you know, if you're asking somebody to add a, a video, for example, uh, you know, you want them to do an introduction, you want them to add a video, you can't assume that they're just going to know how to do that. Well, and, and it's not uncommon to say, and I'm not talking about here, go to the LMS, find the shell, and I have a video on how to do it. This is three, four layers of complexity beyond where the student <laughs> may be, right? Right, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, so all, all of that is, is very true as well. Um, that, right. you know, you, you have to give steps on how to do things. We have to, and I'm going to say another element that you reminded me of, although unrelated, but you reminded me of it, is we have a tendency of saying, well, we want you to do two discussions a week and to respond to two people's discussion uh, elements. And we consider that to be the interactive part of, of our uh, teaching and learning. How much interaction do you have when I'm writing uh, something that's based on what your discussion point was and you're doing it to me. There isn't a whole lot there. So what kind of activities are we building in our classroom, learning activities, and how are we considering the variety of students that we have? How are we uh, assuring the folks who are auditory versus visual versus kinesthetic learners that they're getting, you know, what they're, how they can learn? You know, when we were stuck with particular things, because this is what we've done all along and this is what we consider to be right. One of my favorite assignments, and this goes back to high school. Okay. Um, so I was in English class and... Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and for sort of, I think it was an end of semester project, but I don't remember for sure now. But one of the things that, that we got to do is kind of choose the project and, and how you want to submit it. So uh, I was incredibly interested in journalism. So I put together a newspaper uh, that fit, I think it was probably, uh, you know, Mark Twain sort of book that we were reading and uh, put together a newspaper that sort of fit the era and uh, you know, had some, some things in there about, you know, Huckleberry Finn mm -hmm. and, you know, also found some era specific things that also fit in that. And that was a, a fun project to do. Sure. Uh, another high school project that I did, um, and I hate to keep focusing on high school. No, but, but those are good. The, it these, doesn't matter. Learning right, is learning. Right. So, uh, this was in a history class, and we were assigned to uh, talk to a veteran. And you had a variety of different options within the assignment on how you wanted to do that. So I had a paper out at the time, and... Knowing how old you are, you probably talked with a revolutionary <laughs> war veteran. I'm kidding. Yeah. So I talked to a, a World War II vet, and... Uh, he flew on bomber missions. Wow. And he actually just passed away here not too long oh, ago. Sorry about that. Um, but the, the thing that, that I learned from that is, you know, first of all, I got to hear firsthand stories about World War II. Uh, but the thing I found out a little while later, um, he brought out this trunk that had all of these keepsakes that he had gathered during this time. And he was showing this to me, and one of my friends was also there during this. So he was showing this to us. I talked to his wife later. She had never seen that. She had never heard some of these stories before. And, you know, they had been married for quite forever. Some time. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they got married right after World War II. So, you know, plenty of opportunities to hear those right. stories, but she'd never heard them. And that is something, 
you know, that, that I had heard several times, you know, my mom would run into them and he would still talk about that. Wow. Talk about that experience. And, you know, for me, it was incredible because I'm talking to somebody, I'm hearing stories, I have this natural curiosity. And, and, and what a great way to then be able to go and, and put these in an assignment. Kind of like the journalism in practice. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, for him, it was a chance to, to get this information out there, tell a story, and share something that I think he had wanted to share for a while, yeah. but maybe didn't really know how to share that. Right. And it was hugely beneficial to him. Um, and you. And me, absolutely. So, you know, things like that, finding creative ways to give an assignment and, and put something into context. It would have been really easy in that class that, you know, oh, you're going to write about this particular battle or, or whatever. Um, yeah. But, Go to the library, pick out a yeah, few books and yeah, dig into and, it. Yeah, and, and write about it. Um, and that would have checked a lot of boxes. But mm -hmm. this was a unique story that now, 30 years later almost, I still remember it. Their family still remembers it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what a great way to have multiple touch points. And, and think about the learning you got out of it that although books are very important, you would not have gotten, even if somebody were to have written their own biography, autobiography. Right, well, and you know, think about the other benefits of an assignment like that. Um, you know, certainly there, there was the very core, you're taking this and you're writing it down, mm -hmm. you're, you're taking you know, this long interview and distilling it down to a, however long of a paper that was. Uh, but you're, you're also getting that one-on-one -on -one interaction. You're learning how to talk to someone, yes. how to interview someone. Skills, yep. Yeah. yep. So, you know, there are a lot of opportunities there. And, and these are all things that institutionally we want our students to have. Yes. And, you know, interpersonal communications is not siloed only in an interpersonal communications class. You're so right. And, and I, I'd like to, to add, um, as I'm listening to you, and, and this is a conversation you and I had a few times, which is, why is our Composition One uh, course about esoteric things? Why isn't it about the assignments the students are working on in their sociology, psychology, whatever classes? Right. And why aren't those contextualized? Right. I mean, you know, in college, and, and this is probably why you said this, so I can segue into this very easily. Yeah. Uh, we had a class that would probably Telepathy. Be, yes. <laughs> that would probably be similar to, like, what our Comp 1 class is here. And uh, everybody at DePaul had to take it, uh, almost, with the exception of probably about 10% of the population. And it was just sort of luck of the draw what instructor you got right. when, when you took this. Because so, there are so many sections taught by so many people. Yes. Yeah, so I got an instructor that had like the real like pinup girl sort of vibes where she had like pink hair and like sort of this roller derby look to her. Um, you know, this very like vintage pinup girl style that she would wear. And I remember one project, we could write about basically any topics that we wanted to write about. Uh, because the important thing was, how do you do the research? How do you lay out your arguments? How do you do your, your bibliography and your, your citations and all of that? That doesn't necessarily mean the only way you can do that is to read Shakespeare and, and write about it. So, at that time, I was heavily into rap music. Um, so, I wrote about rap music. I did research. For the record, he's no longer into rap. He's still in hard rock. Yes. Okay, so. uh, I, I still enjoy rap music, though. Um, but it was a chance for me to write about a passion at that point, still doing it in an academic yeah. way, 
Uh, so what's the difference between writing about rap music where I still have to use, you know, journals and I still have to use the... APA and M Yeah, you know, your, your typical research methods and all of that versus, you know, writing about Shakespeare or Catcher in the Rye or, or whatever, you know, topic that you want to write about that, that isn't pop culture. That, that is often avoided in an academic setting. Yeah, we're, you're saying we're a little bit stuffy, but that's true. It's true. I mean... Uh, Tweed with, with leather patches. <laughs> yes. Yeah, in a 16th century building. Uh, yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. And, uh, you know, our conversation is not the end of... Uh, what we're going to be talking about over time. But the idea is how can we help and equip our faculty with the tools that they need so that the learners are the beneficiaries? And how can we really try to meet the student where she or he are at, knowing that we have significant number of students in every section? And, but if you don't believe in your student, then they won't believe in themselves and they mm -hmm. won't succeed. And if we don't, if we're gonna do what we think is right because this is how we learned it, how are we gonna ensure their success? And we all want our students to succeed. Oh, you betcha. That's what we're, the business we're in. Right. This is a topic, Zahi, that I think you and I could chew on for hours on. We could, end. we could. Um, and you can go on to talking about football and-, and I and, wrote you know, about that too. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote about a lot of things. Well, you probably uh, had to, and you probably enjoyed it. Right. And, you know, I, I think part of that, and I had a conversation with someone here the other day that, uh, you know, said, I, I every once in a while hear from students, and, and they say, I don't really like school. It's very common. And, you know, we were both talking that, like for us, that was something that was hard to relate to. Uh, but is it they don't like school because they don't like how things are being taught? They don't like how the assignments are working? I mean, there are a lot of ways that that can happen. But, you know, I think if I would have taken that English 130 class that, that I was just talking about and I had to write only about Shakespeare, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed that, and I probably would not have done as well as I did in that class. Would I have adapted? Yeah, probably so. But, you know, this particular instructor found a way that made the class enjoyable for the students and still managed to take care of the, the expected learning outcomes of that class. Absolutely, and, and I think we all should and could consider those things where salient. Do we want to remove any memorization? No, sometimes some things have to be memorized, but is it everything that we do that needs to be memorized? And, you know, we can get down rabbit holes if, you know, this is how many uh, chapters I need to cover each day, so simply because the book has that many chapters. That's... Those are discussions we, we could have and potentially should have, but teaching is about empowering the individual learner, and it's not about showing how much we know, in my opinion. Because, you know, we're subject matter experts. If we don't know it, we have issues. That's right. Well, Zahi, you and I have been yeah. talking for almost 30 minutes on this topic today. Poor people. <laughs> we, we will probably definitely be talking about this more down the road. Uh -huh. So uh, if you like content like this, be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Ring that bell down below yes. so you get notifications when we post new content. Certainly follow us on our other social media platforms as well. Be looking out for some really new, interesting student engagement content, uh, uh -huh. student generated content rather. Yeah, generated. Com yes, generated, uh, coming out here uh, fairly soon that, that we're going to... I'm hoping next week we'll have it up and going for people. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about this here on Trail Talk sometime down the road, too. Yeah, and 
I made a comment a couple of weeks ago that he's getting into TikTok. That might explain my statement. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, on that note. <laughs> on, that note <laughs> on that high note. <laughs> yes. I uh, want to thank you for joining us on Trail Talk this week. Uh, so, for Dr. Zahi Atala, I'm Chris Ford. We'll see you next time on Trail Talk on LTTV.